This is the true story of the Worksop Poltergeist. Now this case occurred in 1883 in a residential household located in Worksop, which is a town in the industrial heartland of Northern England. It is among the earliest of its kind to be investigated by the Society for Psychical Research. And some of the reported incidents included a sudden onset of shocking and violent disturbances that continued for several days. Several witnesses, including a high-ranking police officer, insisted that no living person was responsible. As in many other cases of similar type, it also appears that a single individual, namely a young girl, was in some way the cause of the activity. Now this is the full report by Mr Frank Podmore of the Society for Psychical Research, which was originally conducted in 1884. So please remember that English was spoken slightly differently in those days and rather than update the wording of Mr. Prodmore, I decided to read his report verbatim. At the beginning of March in 1883, the Retford and Gainsborough Times along with other local newspapers gave harrowing accounts of some remarkable disturbances which had occurred at the house of a small horse dealer in Worksop named Mr. Joe White. Two members of the Psychical Society entered into communication with the principal person named in the newspaper reports and with a friend in the neighbourhood who very kindly inquired into the matter on behalf of the Society. However, it soon became apparent that as nearly all the witnesses of the occurrences related were of the humbler class and unable therefore to write a connected account of what had happened. The best way to arrive at the truth of the matter was for one of us to go in person to make our own enquiries. At the request of the Haunted House Committee, I went down to Worksop on the afternoon of Saturday the 7th of April, with the intention of inspecting the actual scene of the occurrences and to personally interrogate the principal witnesses, in order, if possible, to arrive at some rational explanation as to the bizarre goings on. I spent the Saturday evening and the whole of the following day on my inquiries and have now, I think, obtained as intelligible and trustworthy a report on the matter as possible regarding the nature of the reported phenomena and the character of the witnesses. I derived my information from several principal eyewitnesses of the disturbances whom I interrogated with the single exception of Mr White himself. I wrote out the statement of each witness in full immediately after the interview and the three most important witnesses, Higgs, Kuras and White, subsequently read through my notes and signed them. The depositions of these three persons are printed in full. My time was too short to allow a second interview with the four other principal witnesses and I was unable therefore to obtain their signature but I have incorporated the statements of all the principal witnesses in my report. Besides the seven chiefly concerned, I questioned, in presence of White and his wife, three or four other witnesses, viz, White's brother, Tom, a bright-looking lad of 18 to 20, Solomon Wass and his wife, next-door neighbours of the Whites, the former and ordinary North countryman of the lower class, the latter a pleasant looking intelligent woman, and George Ford Buckford, a man of about 28. From these I obtained general confirmation of the various incidents as described by White and Higgs at which they had themselves been present, but time did not permit of much cross-questioning nor of taking down their evidence in full. Now White's house has been built according to his own statement about 11 years. He has only resided in there for three years. I was unable to discover anything about the former occupants. The house stands at the end of a piece of wasteland called the New Building Ground, with another house or cottage attached. The nearest separate building being a public house about 100 yards off, with the exception there are no other buildings within about 200 yards. There is no entrance to the house by the front, the front door being locked and the joints secured with paper from the inside. Entrance is obtained by a covered passage open at either end which separates the two houses and gives access immediately to the yard. Surrounded on one side by high palings and on the other three by piggeries, stables and two houses. 
The kitchen is about 15 foot square. The upper floor is divided into two rooms, the back one corresponding to the kitchen. Being used as a bedroom for Tom and the children, the front one as a storehouse for bacon, horse furniture and various odds and ends. There is also a garret above this into which I did not enter, it being at the time full of bacon in salt. The whole house not excepting the bedrooms is hung with bacon, the very staircase being lined with it so that I had to draw my coat close to me in going up. A large part of the bacon, as I was told by White, had gone bad during the period of the disturbances. The front or inner room of the ground floor was an ordinary room like all the rest of the house, half filled with bacon and containing besides bedroom furniture a large beer barrel or trestles. Everything in it filthy dirty. I looked all over the house in daylight but could discern no holes in the walls, ceilings, nor any trace of the extensive or elaborate machinery which would have been required to produce the movements by ordinary mechanical means. The history of the disturbances, as gathered from the various witnesses whom I interrogated, appears to be briefly as follows. Nothing remarkable had been seen or heard in the house until about the 20th or the 21st of February, 1883, when a Mrs. White was alone with two of the children in the kitchen one evening, washing up the tea things at the table. The table tilted up at a considerable angle, the candle was upset, and the wash tub only saved by Mrs. White holding it. She positively assured me that she entered no pressure whatsoever upon the table, and the whole incident struck her as very extraordinary. Her husband made light of it at the time. On Monday, February the 26th, White was absent from home until the Wednesday afternoon. On the Monday, his wife allowed a girl, Eliza Rose, the child of an imbecile mother and herself regarded as half-witted, to come into the house and share her bed at night. White returned on Wednesday night, but left on the following morning until Friday. During that one night, the girl slept on the squab. On Thursday night, the 1st of March, at about 11pm, Tom White went up to bed, the three children having gone up some hours before. At about 11.30, Mrs. White and Eliza Rose, being then alone in the kitchen, witnessed various things such as a corkscrew, clothes pegs, a salt cellar and a meat knife, which had been in the kitchen only a few minutes before, came tumbling step by step down the kitchen stairs. Tom positively and solemnly denied having thrown the articles, and the mystery was increased when at least 20 minutes later, after he had gone upstairs, no one having left the room in the interval, some hot coals were also thrown down the stairs. On the following night, the 2nd of March, at about the same hour, White, Mrs. White and Rose being in the kitchen, a noise was heard as of someone coming down the passage between the two houses and stopping just outside the door. White told Rose to open the door, but she was too afraid to do so. Then they heard as a single, which is a strap used in a horse's harness, and immediately afterwards some pieces of carpet thrown down the stairs, followed by more knives, this time accompanied by forks. The girl picked them up, but they followed still faster. White then left the room to go up to Tom. During his absence, one of the ornaments flew off the mantelpiece into the corner of the room near the door. Nothing was seen by the two women, but they heard it fall and found it there. Their screams summoned White down. As he entered the room, his candle blew out and something struck him on the forehead. The girl picked up the candle, which appears to have left the candlestick and two new ones, which had not been in the house previously, from the ground. And as soon as the candle was lit, a little china woman left the mantelpiece and fell into the corner, where it was seen by Mr. White. As soon as it was replaced, it flew across the room yet again, and this time was broken. Other things followed, and the woman being very frightened, and White thinking that the disturbances presaged the death of his child, who was very ill with an abscess in the back, sent Tom, who was afraid to go alone, with Ford to fetch the doctor. Mrs. White, meanwhile, took one of the children next door, 
Rose approached the inner room to fetch another when things immediately began to fly about and smash themselves in that room. After this all appeared to have been absent from the house for a short time, White then returned with Higgs, a policeman, and whilst they were alone in the kitchen, standing near the door, a glass jar flew out of the cupboard into the yard. A tumbler also fell from the chest of drawers in the kitchen, when only Higgs was near it. Both then went into the inner room and found the chest of drawers turned up on end and smashed in. On their return they found Rose, Wass and Tom White in the kitchen and Mrs Wass and all saw a cream jug which Rose had just placed on the bin fly four feet, tip in the air and smash on the floor. Dr Lloyd and Mrs White then entered and in the presence of all these witnesses a basin was seen to rise slowly from the bin, no person being near it except Dr Lloyd and Higgs. It touched the ceiling and then fell suddenly to the floor and smashed. This was at 12pm. All then left except Tom White and his brother. The disturbances continued until about 2am when all grew quiet and the Whites eventually got to sleep at approximately 8 a.m. However, on Saturday the 3rd, the disturbances began yet again. White left the kitchen to attend to some pigs and in his absence, Mrs. White and Rose were left alone in the kitchen. A nearly empty port wine bottle leaped up from the table about four feet into the air and fell into the bucket of milk standing on the table from which Mrs. White was filling some jugs. Then Curas appears to have been attracted to the scene. He entered with White, Young Wass and others. They all viewed the inner room, but just returned to the kitchen, leaving the inner room empty and the door of communication open when the American clock, which hung over the bed, was heard to strike. It had not done so for 18 months previously. A crash was then heard and Curious, who was the nearest to the door, looked in and found that the clock had fallen over the bed about four feet broad and was lying on the floor. Shortly afterwards, no one being near it, a china dog flew off the mantelpiece and smashed itself into the corner of the room. Curious and the others immediately left. More plates and another cream jug then flew up into the air and again smashed themselves in view of all who were in the kitchen, the Whites, Rose and Mrs Wass. White lay down on the sofa, but the disturbances continued during his attempted siesta. In particular, some pictures on the wall next to the pantry began to move, but were taken down at once by his brother. At about 2pm, a Salvation Army woman came in and talked to White. Rose only was with him in the kitchen. A candlestick flew from the bin and fell behind the Salvation Army woman as she stood near the pantry door, who immediately left the room in terror. Other things then followed at intervals. A full medicine bottle flew without breaking. An empty medicine bottle and a lamp glass fell and broke themselves. It was then about 4 p.m. and White could stand it no longer. He told the girls she must go. She did in fact leave before 5pm. After her departure, nothing whatever of an abnormal character took place and the house was remained undisturbed up to the present time. With regard to the positions of the persons present in relation to the objects moved, it may be stated generally that there was no possibility in most cases of the objects having been thrown by hand. It will be seen on reference to the depositions of the witnesses which are appended that the objects were frequently moved in a remote corner of the room or even in an adjoining room. Moreover, the character of the movements in many cases was such as to preclude the possibility of the objects having been thrown. It will be noted that there is a discrepancy between White's and Curis's version of this incident. Mrs White, however, confirmed her husband's account, and I have little doubt that the statement in the text is substantially accurate. Curas is more likely than White to have been mistaken in his recollection of White's position at the time. 
Curis's account of his own position does not differ greatly from that given by White. The material point at both witnesses are agreed is that no one saw the clock fall. Curis's written statement is not clear at this point, but he told me that his attention was drawn to what had taken place by hearing the crash. I only then turned round and saw the clock lying on the floor. Of course, the obvious explanation of these occurrences is trickery on the part of some of the persons present. In regard to this, it seems to me a matter of very little significance that most of the educated people in workshop believe White himself to have caused the disturbance. For most educated persons, as we know, would not be ready to admit any other than a mechanical explanation. And if such an explanation be adopted, White, the owner of the house, a man of considerable intelligence whose record was not entirely clean and who was himself present on the occasion of nearly all the disturbances, must obviously be the agent. But whilst believing White to be at the bottom of the matter, none of the persons with whom I conversed were prepared with any explanation of his modus operandi. That he should have thrown the things was universally admitted to be impossible and beyond this I could not discover little more than an unquestioning faith in the omnipotence of electricity. No one professed to have any idea what mechanical means could have been employed or how they could have been adapted. To the end in view, still less did anyone pretend to have discovered any indications in the house itself of any machinery having been used. Moreover, there was a total absence of any apparent motive on White's part, supposing him to have been capable of affecting the movements himself, whilst he was unquestionably a considerable loser to the extent of nearly £9, as estimated by himself, though this estimate is probably exaggerated by the articles broken. He appears to have reaped no corresponding advantage. The one motive which I heard suggested, if we disregard a report in one newspaper, subsequently contradicted in another, to the effect that White was anxious to buy the house and to buy it cheap, was that he produced the disturbances in fulfilment of a sporting bet. But I saw no reason to regard this explanation as anything but a schoolium, evolved by some ingenious commentator from the facts themselves. Again, had White himself been the principal agent in the matter, it is clear that he must have had at least two confederates, for he was not himself present during the disturbances on the Thursday night which might indeed have been caused by his brother Tom. Moreover, these confederates must not only have extreme skill, but they must have been capable of more than ordinary reticence and self-control, for it is remarkable that, with the single exception of the statements made by the girl Rose, no one professed to have heard even a hint from White himself, from his brother, or from any other of any trickery in the matter. Moreover, it is hard to conceive by what mechanical appliance, under the circumstances described, the movements could have been effected. The clock, for instance, a heavy American one, was thrust out from the wall in a horizontal direction so as apparently to clear a four-foot bedstead which lay immediately beneath it, and the nail from which it depended remained in situ on the wall. The objects thrown about in the kitchen moved generally, but by no means always, in the direction of the outer door and it is noticeable that in most cases they do not appear to have been thrown, but in some manner borne or wafted across the room, for though they fell on a stone floor 15 foot or 16 foot distant, they were often unbroken and were rarely shivered, and it is impossible to reconcile the account given of the movement of some other objects, variously scribed as jerky, twirling and turning over and over, with the supposition that the objects depended on any fixed support or were in any way suspended. Lastly, to suppose that these various objects were all moved by mechanical means argues incredible stupidity, amounting almost to imbecility on the part of all the persons present who were not in the plot that the movement of the arms necessary to set the machinery in motion should have passed unobserved on each and every occasion by all the witnesses is almost impossible. 
Not only so, but Curious Higgs and Dr. Lloyd, all independent observers, assured me that they examined some of the objects which had been moved immediately after the occurrence, with the express intention of discovering, if possible, any clue to an explanation of the matter, but entirely failed to do so. So these men were not over-credulous, they certainly were not wanting in intelligence, and they were not, any of them, prepossessed in favour of White, but they each admitted that they could discover no possible explanation of the disturbances and were fairly bewildered by the whole matter. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave this one up to you as to whether Mr and Mrs White were telling the truth or not. Please leave a comment with a yes if you think they were telling the truth or leave a comment with a no if you don't think they were telling the truth. And thank you to everyone who listened. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did enjoy, I would ask that you please consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up. Take care. And as always, sweet dreams. <laughs>